Lord, I thank you for this day once again, Father. God, I pray that as we get in the book of Revelation, that you would um, bless us, that we would read, hear, and keep the words that are written in this prophecy, Father. Lord, I pray that you grant me the gift of teaching by your Holy Spirit, the gift of prophecy, the gift of exhortation. God, apart from you, I have no spiritual power or abilities, Lord. It's just my flesh. So, Lord, may my flesh get out of the way. May you reach us here, reach our brothers and sisters that will listen to this online. Lord, may your name be glorified. Father, we pray to you to come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 today, starting in verse 8. But before you go there, please look with me at Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So we want to read this, we want to hear this, we want to keep this, and we want to be blessed by God in it today. So chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say, they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall, shall not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have, those, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent. Or else I'll come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. We're going to stop there today. We're in the second part of the book of Revelation. It's broken up into three different parts. The things which were when John was on the island of Patmos, which is chapter 1, he sees the Lord in his glorified state. The things which are is the second section, that is the current church age of that day and age, but it's also representative, I believe, of all of the churches as a whole to say that we all have certain attributes that come from these seven churches, seven being the number of completion. Then the third part of the book of Revelation, or the third section, is the prophetic section. And that outline is given to us in chapter 1, verse 19. Write these things which you have seen, that's the first part that John saw, and the things which are, that's the section we're in right now, the things which are during that day, but applicable to us today, and the things which will take place after this, that is the prophetic section of the book of Revelation. But before the judgment comes in the prophetic section, Jesus always starts with his own church. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? It starts here. I certainly believe that we are living in the last days. If you look at everything going on right now, you see the wickedness of society has been like Sodom and Gomorrah for a while. It has been like the days of Noah where we see violence and just wickedness and the intent of the thought of the heart is evil continually. And now we also see this whole idea where we could really see the mark of the beast coming. We will not be here to see the mark of the beast because we are Christians. That doesn't happen till the middle of the tribulation. But you see the foundation of it being laid and something that people would willingly want to take to buy, sell, or trade. And those that don't take it will be deserving of death to be beheaded. And you see that going on right now. A lot of it even just with masks. Oh, you're a danger to society or a threat. You shouldn't be around other people. And so we need to prepare our hearts for judgment to begin in our own hearts at the church. That Jesus would deal with us before the tribulation so that we would be right. So please look at me. Chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, 
These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I'm not going to get deep into it, but the angel of the church of Smyrna, this is clearly the senior pastor, senior elder, senior bishop, whatever title you would give him. These things, says the first and the last. Jesus is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega, who was dead and came to life. He is the one that overcame death and rose again. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So he starts out with, I know your works. He starts every church, or I shouldn't say he starts in the very beginning, but he tells every church, I know your works. And there's that false doctrine today that as soon as you hear the word works, legalism they cry. It's not legalism. Works. Works are essential. We're not saved by works. We know that we're saved by the blood of Jesus, but works show our true faith. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is never on the day of heaven that we can say, I deserve heaven, or on the day of judgment that I deserve entrance because what I have done. That is not true. You are saved by God's grace through faith in him, faith in his sacrifice, faith in his mercy and in his grace towards us. That, that's why we're saved. That's it. There's nothing that we can attribute to ourselves that I am saved because I have done something really good. That's workspace. It means that God owes you something. God owes no man anything. We're only saved by grace. Now, our works follow our faith. When you have faith because you're saved by grace through faith, faith always has works attached to it. But it's not works that saves you. James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. It's always faith first. Faith without works is dead. It means that your faith is useless. So if you're saved by grace through faith, but your faith has no evidence, it's just dead faith. So Jesus starts out, I know your works. Your tribulation. This church had been through tribulation. They had been through trials. They had been persecuted. He says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. I know your poverty, but you are rich. Now to get the context of this, Smyrna was a wealthy city. So they're not poor because of their demographics. It's not like they're out in the middle of Africa somewhere where they don't have much money and they barely have water and they're, they're just trying to scrape by. No, they're in a wealthy area. However, Jesus says, I know your poverty. So we can conclude that their poverty was a result of their Christianity. Their poverty was a result of their faith. That because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they had been shunned by society. That possibly that people would no longer hire them because they were Christians. They wouldn't want to do business with them because they were Christians. And so because of Jesus Christ, they became physically poor in this world. But here's the great news. Jesus says, but you are rich. I know your poverty, but you are rich. And isn't that what we would want the Lord to say to us? You're rich. Not rich according to the world, but rich according to him. And that's quite the contrast to the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church says, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That was their own saying. This church could say, I'm poor, but Jesus says, you're rich. You're rich in faith. You're rich in eternal reward. But there was the church of Laodicea that they themselves declared, I am rich. I am wealthy. I don't need anything. What, what else could I need? I have a great house. I have great cars. I'm well clothed. Look at all the food. I need nothing. Well, Jesus says to that church, and do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. That's what he told the church that declared their own wealth and riches, that they were wretched, miserable. They were poor. They weren't really rich, but he tells the poor church in the world that you are rich. He says, blind and naked. Then Jesus tells that church, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And remember that the Bible does not tell us to store up gold in the last days. It warns us about it. If you have some earthly riches, Buy gold from Jesus. Get rich in heaven. That is the gold you're supposed to be investing in. Now, before we go on, the Bible never says that being rich is a sin. But the Bible does tell us that being rich can lead to sin. And so we have to be very 
careful about that because you can be rich in this earth and rich in heaven. It can, it will be more difficult, but you can do it. However, we want Jesus to say, you're rich. It does not matter if somebody that's an accountant or somebody that's a financial investor and helps you plan a retirement says, boy, you are so rich. I, I want Jesus to say, you're rich. Jesus say, you know what? You're rich towards me. You're, you are rich in heaven. The sins that being rich can lead to is number one, not being rich toward God. That often happens. People that get focused on earthly riches are not rich towards God. And they'll have several excuses of why they can't give. Yet they have an abundance of goods, but they can't give. Can't afford, can't do this, can't do that. They are not rich towards God. Number two, you can trust in your riches when you are rich. The Laodicean church, I have become, I'm in need of nothing. I have everything. They're trusting in their riches. Number three, you can love riches. So being rich is not a sin in this world, but being rich can lead to sin, so we need to be on guard, especially being Americans, that we don't fall into those three sins that we're not rich towards God, but that we trust in riches and we love riches. We want Jesus to say, you are rich. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, the Bible tells us, now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and is certain we carry nothing out, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. If you had food and clothes today, be content. That's enough. I don't need any more. But those, now listen, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And in a many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, you cannot defy the Bible. If you think like Solomon did that you can marry foreign wives and not turn from God, even though God said you will, you're going to fall, even if you're the wisest man on earth. If you desire to be rich, if, that, if you look at riches of this world and you say, that's my desire. You see that big, beautiful place and that car and that prestige and that title? I desire that. Well, the Bible tells you, and you will not defy this, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You will fall into temptation. You will fall into a snare. That means you'll be caught up into this world. You will, you will be falling into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Just a desire to be rich. Doesn't even mean you'll ever get rich. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We need to be rich towards God. The Bible also tells us, command those who are rich in this present age. So this is dealing with those who are rich in this present age. This applies to most Americans. Command those who are rich in this present age in this world not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Don't be haughty like the Laodicean church. Be humble. Don't think, I am rich in need of nothing. No, realize you're in need of God and his daily bread. You're in need of him to sustain your life, that your riches will not protect you. They are green rectangles that could lose your value. We need to trust in God. It says to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Now, you have some that take the opposite side, and it's not biblical, saying, well, if you have riches, that's just evil. You're so into this world. You're so ungodly. No, God can give you richly all things to enjoy. That, that's fine. You can be rich in this present age. You're just not to be haughty. You're not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And God gives us richly all things to enjoy. You can enjoy something in this world. God didn't take away every form of pleasure, but it's loving pleasure more than God. That is the sin. Let them do good. This is the instruction for those who are rich in this age. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for, this, for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You're called to be rich towards God. Mark chapter 10. Most of us know about the rich young ruler, a guy who had a lot of money. He was actually a very nice man. He was a good neighbor. He obeyed the commands of man to man, just not the God to man commands. Mark 10, 20, and he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth, all the commands to be loving, be kind, your neighbor. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way. So whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Do you realize he could have treasure in heaven? He lacked 
He lacked one thing. He still wasn't saved. He still wasn't getting there. You know what he lacked? He had a false god. His false god was his money. So he had to take his money, get, sell what he had, give it to the poor, get rid of his false god, get rid of his money. Then you can come follow Jesus. Then you can have riches in heaven. But right now he wasn't rich in heaven. Jesus wasn't saying you are rich like he said to the church of Smyrna. He's essentially saying you are poor, but you can be rich. So whatever you have, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. What was his God? His riches, his money. He, he was sad. He didn't want to hear Jesus say that. And there are people that get really sad and really grieved when they read in the, in the Bible about giving. Oh, I, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, I'll be loving to my neighbor. I'll do lots of things, but to, to get rid of my riches? I, they can't do it. They'll walk away sorrowful. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard. It does make it a little bit harder sometimes. And it doesn't mean that all poor people are saved. Not at all. But it can be hard because people can love riches. And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? Because you often trust in your riches. The rich young ruler could have been trusting his riches to make him happy. Oh, this is what makes me happy. Trusting in them to take care of him. Oh, I'm going to take care of myself with my riches. I'll take care of those around me with my riches. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they're greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. It's possible for a rich man to get saved with the Lord. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said assuredly, I say to you, there is no one, and this includes you and I, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, and mothers, and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come eternal life. Now, I don't believe that Jesus literally means you're going to get 100 houses and 100 family members. That's obviously not literal. It's figuratively speaking, but you're going to be blessed beyond belief. You can't give something to the Lord and not be blessed. You can't give your last two mites and Jesus say, you fool, who's going to take care of you now like the, the widow? No, he's going to take care of you. you. You give to the Lord. You leave things in the name of Jesus and for the name of the gospel. You're going to be blessed. He's going to bless you. It's going to be returned to you, the blessing. Now, we don't do it because of that, but you can trust that he will bless you. But you also get persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. So Jesus tells his church of Smyrna, I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich. He says, you're rich. What a blessing that is to hear. May, may the Lord say to us today, you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He knows the blasphemy of these Jews, these fake Jews. They were most likely not directly blaspheming God, but they were probably blaspheming the Smyrna Christians saying things about them, accusing them, bringing accusations that were false against the Christians in Smyrna. And by blaspheming these Christians, yes, they are indirectly blaspheming Jesus Christ. And he says about these people who say they are Jews and are not. So they said they were Jews, but Jesus says they're not really Jews. Now, I, I certainly believe they physically were Jews or they were proselytes to the Jewish religion, but Jesus says they're not Jews. Now, to understand this, you, you have to grasp that the early church started out with Jewish people. Je Jesus went to Israel. And so the gospel went to them first. So all the first initial Christians, what are they? They're Jews. So all real Jews would have accepted Christ as Savior. And then even when Paul goes out, where does Paul go first in the book of Acts? To the Jews. He goes and finds a synagogue. He preaches the gospel to them, and then he'll go to the Gentiles. Same gospel, not two gospels, as heretics teach. Romans 1.16, Paul writes, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. He went to the Jews first. 
So obviously, the Jews in Smyrna had heard the gospel, but they did not receive the gospel. They said we are Jews, but Jesus says they're not real Jews because real Jews would have gotten saved. Yes, physically they're Jews. Ethnically, they, they were Jews. And there is a plan for ethnic Israel. They're going to be grafted back in, but they're not real Jews in the heart. Romans 2.28 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. They weren't real Jews in heart. They weren't real converts. If they really loved God, they would have accepted Christ. So they maintained their Judaism. They maintained their synagogue. They maintained as a religious group, but they blasphemed those who really believed in Jesus, those who had the real heart. They came against those people. And Jesus says, I know this. I know that they're doing to you, this to you. He says, but they're the synagogue of Satan. I like that. There, there's no exaggeration with Jesus. He, he calls their religious institution, the synagogue of Satan, but they're the synagogue of Satan. We, we often think as Americans that the, you know, the synagogue of Satan is the satanic church with Anton LaVey because the, they call themselves the church of Satan. That's true. They can be the church of Satan, but also other false institutions that say they're Jews, say that they're Christian churches. They can also be the church of Satan, the synagogue of Satan. They, they don't have to actually say, I'm part of the church of Satan and I follow Anton LaVey. No, they can be of the synagogue of Satan or the church of Satan because they reject Jesus and they come against the truth. They are satanic. Just because they meet in a big seeker sensitive building or really positive and really hip doesn't mean they're of Christ. They can be the church of Satan, even though that's not their title. I doubt that these Jews went around and saying, oh, we're we're Satan worshipers. No, they claim to be the real Jews and came against these Christians. They claim to be the real people of God, as do many churches today claim to be, oh, we are Christians. And then you have these people over here who are nitpicking, coming against this good work we're doing for the greater good. They like that line. And they say, oh, Pastor Rob, he's not that good. Well, you know what? They're, most of them are the church of Satan, even though they don't have an Anton LaVey sticker over there or a Satanic Bible. Even today, the land of Israel, God does not speak highly of the spirituality of that land. In Revelation 11, 8, this is speaking of the middle of the tribulation when the two witnesses die. It says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Spiritually, Sodom in Egypt is not godly right now. Now, I'm pro-Israel 100%. God has a plan for that land that has a piece of land that's very significant in the Bible. Jesus will rule and reign from there. But spiritually speaking, it is not in a good place. And Jesus says, this church here, or this fake church, is the synagogue of Satan. And he says, do not fear those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, this church has no direct sin that Jesus rebukes him of. Zero things that Jesus rebukes or corrects. At most right here, we have a warning. A warning and an exhortation do its right. They, that they have to keep on going. If there's something ahead, persevere get through this. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. These guys are about to suffer. They already had tribulation. They already had poverty because they are Christians. They're already being blasphemed by the synagogue of Satan. And now Jesus tells them, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. There is even greater suffering coming for this church. And he tells them, do not fear. You're going to suffer, but do not fear. Now, naturally, we do have feelings as humans. We don't go by our feelings, though. We go by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Somebody can feel fear, but we have to not give in to that fear. We have to not sit there and meditate upon what we think could happen and be scared about it. We need to meditate upon the Word of God. And if you're fearful of something, you need to cast your care upon God because He cares about you. That, that's what you're supposed to do with fear. Don't fear. Fearing is a sin. To actually sit there and give in to a fear and act upon a fear is sin. Do not fear, Jesus says. We're called to fear him, but do not fear these tribulations that are about to try you. Just commit your soul unto the Lord. And if something is making you fearful, which naturally can happen, 
Don't meditate on it. Go to God with it and give it to him. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares about you. He says, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. So who's going to throw them into prison? The devil is going to throw them into prison. The persecution is going to be ramped up and they're going to be thrown into prison. It's the work of the devil. But God is going to use this work of the devil to test them. They're going to be tested. Yes, he has not rebuked them, but he's going to test them. We all must be tested. All of our faith is going to be tested. That's how it's proven. That's how you know whether it's genuine or not. You, you can't just say you have something and have it be tested. Somebody could say, oh, I'm so smart. I know everything. I should become a doctor. Well, you need to be tested. You need to prove that you know something. You need to prove that you are what you say you are. And this church, they, that you could say, well, yeah, they'd prove it a lot, but they still need to prove. They're going to be tested. Some of them, the devil's going to throw some of them into prison. Jesus, in Matthew 4, 1, says, And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit led him into the wilderness to do what? To be tempted by the devil. God doesn't tempt you. God doesn't throw you into prison. The devil will throw you into prison for being a Christian. God doesn't persecute you for being a Christian. The devil persecutes you for being a Christian. But God uses it to test you. Jesus got tempted by the devil. You can say he got tested by the devil, proved to be 100% sinless, proved to be the son of God, because you can't literally tempt Jesus the same way we can be tempted, because he is perfect. But these tests show us where our true faith is at. And they, they had already persevered some, but there are some Christians that start out but don't finish because of the sin, or because of the, the temptations, because of the testing they cannot pass. Matthew 13, 20, but he who received the seed on the stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Some will stumble. Some will, some will just not make it. They'll, they'll receive it. They'll say, oh, I love Jesus. But the persecution causes them to stop. That, that one says immediately. Here, these people had already persevered some. And now they're going to be tested. And they have to pass the test. We're going to be tested. Th these days are getting darker and darker and darker. I, I do not believe that it's going to be easier to be a Christian as time goes on, it, whatever the time is before the rapture right now. It's not going to get easier. We're going to be tested more. And our tests have been relatively light as Americans. But you need to be ready to be tested. Know that things stand before you and you have to pass the test. I'm not saying that God's not merciful and that God's not forgiving. But you do need to eventually pass. And sometimes when we fail, we get the do-overs. Okay, you didn't pass that time. But God, God's gracious. He'll give you another chance to go through it. But we have to pass the test in our hearts. We have to be ready to do it. Do not fear any of those things which are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. We're going to be tested. And you will have tribulation 10 days. Commentators have a lot of different takes on this 10-day tribulation and different interpretations of it. I, I don't see any reason not to take it literally, that there is a specific 10-day period that this church went through, that there were tribulations there tough. And he says, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. There's the exhortation along with the warning. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Yet you have to finish the race. You started good, but you got to finish what's going on. And just to drive that point further home, the second part of verse 11 says, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Those who overcome, those who don't give in during this time of tribulation and temptation to quit, those that run through the finish line will not be hurt by the second death. You need to overcome. We need to overcome what lies ahead of us. Whatever it may be, only God knows, but we need to overcome these things. We will be ostracized more and more as the days go on. People are fearful for their lives. As Christians, though, we need to be fearful of God. And we need to stand for that. That I fear God. My, my life is in God's hands. And of course, you'll be mocked. Oh, you're, you're just crazy. You're a lunatic. No, I'm not a lunatic. I, I fear God. I don't fear man. I'm called not to fear a disease. I don't look forward to something hitting us physically. But listen, we're told not to fear those things. 
In Revelation 21, 7, it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, and that in the King James is the fearful, but the fearful, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, the sorcerers, and that's pharmacias, drug users, they're not saved, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now what's the promise to this church? Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. See, the fearful get the second death. Again, Jesus says, but the cowardly, or King James says, fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, all these people shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who give in, those who are scared for their lives. But we need to be fearful of God. They, they will get the second death. The second death is at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign. Satan's loosed from his pit for a little while, doesn't tell us the time. And so he's allowed to go deceive people on earth. And after that is the great white throne judgment, which believers will not be at. The unsaved goes to the great white throne judgment. And then all those people, along with death and Hades, are thrown into, into the lake of fire, the, the final destination, the final hell, to say. Revelation 20, 11. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead and who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged in each one according to his works. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. And these Christians here are promised, listen to this, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's a promise to them. Overcome these tribulations. Overcome these 10 days. Don't be fearful and you will not be hurt by the second death. Now this often isn't preached as doctrine. Even though these are the exact words of Jesus, written to the seven churches, written to this particular church, the Church of Smyrna, this is not the Jesus that's presented today. The Jesus that many churches preach and the doctrines that are preached don't line up with what Jesus actually says. Many people teach that Jesus couldn't even say this, that he could never say that you're saved, but you might not be saved, you might not make it, because Jesus didn't teach that. Jesus teaches that. Jesus says that it is a false doctrine. And then they actually make Jesus very sinful and very partial at that point because partiality is evil. If Jesus actually told those in Smyrna who had been persecuted, who had been blasphemed, who had become poor for the name of Jesus, yet were rich in heaven, if he told them that, listen, you have to overcome and then you won't be hurt by the second death. If he told them that, but he wouldn't tell you that, well, then he's partial. Partiality is evil. Romans 2.8 tells us, but those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. God's not partial. There is zero. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Greek, doesn't matter whether your church is Smyrna, doesn't matter whether you're some Baptist church that taught that Jesus can't do this. There's no partiality. It's all according to to his word. Jesus cannot be partial because being partial is sinful. He is not a sinner. If he told them this, he tells us that. It is the same for everybody. He's not going to be harder on Smyrna than he is on us. He's very honest. This is what it is. You're going to have tribulation. Don't be fearful. It's going to be 10 days. Some of you are going to be thrown into prison. Be faithful unto death. This is what he is telling them. And you have tribulation 10 days, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. And don't we look forward to that crown of life someday, that we can have that crown. That's where our eyes are supposed to be fixed. There's tribulations that lie ahead, but you're not looking at this world. You're not looking at what you're going to lose in this world. You're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your salvation. You're looking to that crown of life. You get the crown of life. If you are faithful unto death, you get the crown of life. This was for the church of Smyrna. Jesus is impartial. This is for you and I. You got to finish this out. And when it says faithful unto death, doesn't mean everyone's going to die, but you have to, in your, in your mind and in your heart, be in that place knowing that I could die for the name of Jesus. I could. 
I could lose everything for the name of Jesus, and being okay with that. You, you have to be in that place in your heart, just as Abraham had to be ready to offer up his own son. God didn't make him do it, but you have to be in that place where I'll do whatever. He wants you in that place, and you'll be tested, and we need to be faithful unto death. We need to have our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 one says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to look towards Jesus. This is not the Jesus that is preached today. There's a false Jesus preached, a Jesus that would never say There'll be a lot of people in the day of judgment that aren't saved according to Jesus. But their pastor gave them a pat on the back. Their pastor went to their funeral and told everyone they were saved. Well, the Bible never said they were saved. And that's a bad place to be. Because it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what some other pastor says. If I'm wrong or another pastor is wrong, it's, it's not going to work on the day of judgment. What it has to go by is the word of God. What does the Bible say? Not what doctrine did I concoct? What verses can I cherry pick and make a doctrine that makes you feel good and makes you sleep well at night even though you're in sin? I am very comforted when I read this. I have to tell you that. I'm comforted because I know where I walk with God. I'm, I'm not troubled by this. I am comforted saying, I know my love for the Lord. The Lord knows my love for him. Right now, my life is not physically threatened, but God knows in my heart in my heart, I believe, Lord, hey, if, you, if I need to be killed, I'll do it. Actually, I think that'd be an easy way, a quick ending, to be honest with you. It's a quick ending. Being tortured would be much worse. Having your teeth pulled out with pliers, there's a lot of worse ways to go. But just being killed, beheaded, okay, quick, over, done. Go to heaven. Not a bad idea. Although I think the Lord allows us a lot of times to suffer longer, not to just have an easy out, and just to really, truly say, Lord, I will follow you no matter what. And be comforted because there is a crown of life. If your heart's in the right place, you're like, amen, amen. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go, Lord. I'm ready for that crown. James 1.12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Isn't that amazing? That's a blessing. We're not supposed to look at this and be like, oh, no. No, hey, it's going to come. But we're blessed. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, that means you've been approved, you're, you're a Christian. He will receive the crown of life, which his Lord has promised those who love him. You get a crown of life, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory, which does not fade away. Amen. I mean, this is exciting, a crown of glory, a crown of life. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. And Paul saying, look, I'm, I'm getting a crown of righteousness. And you're getting a crown of righteousness, but you have to finish. You see, some false pastors would tell you, you said a prayer, you're getting a crown of righteousness. Well, I'm telling you, you have to finish this race. As Jesus said, you'll get that crown. You love his appearing, you're going to get that crown. You overcome, you're getting a crown. They leave it out and make it this opposite thing. It's totally different. Oh, just, just say Jesus and you get a crown. No, it's not just say Jesus. It's finish this race, endure, run through the finish line. And you as an ear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We got to hear. We got to hear the truth. Jesus tells each church, I know your works. And he also tells each church, you as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Two things every church has to know. He knows your works and you got to hear what he's saying. Now on to the church of Pergamos. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things, says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. So now he writes again to the pastor of this church, a senior pastor, senior elder. And Jesus identifies himself as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. This is me, the one with the word. And he does this because he later on warns them if you look at verse 16, repent or else I'll come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. They need to know that he has the word and he has the ability just to speak and destroy them. And they're not going to win. In Revelation 1.16, speaking of Jesus, he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. In Revelation 19.15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. There, there is no winning a fight with Jesus. 
he speaks. This right here is his written word, but it's combined together with his spoken word. He, whether he speaks it, whether it's written, it's sharp and two-edged. It judges, it, it cuts both ways. You need to be careful. And so Jesus identifies himself to this church and this pastor. These things says he was a sharp two-edged sword. He, he's coming. He's coming to battle if you don't repent. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So it starts out good. Eh? Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. And, and there's a lot of different takes on the exact interpretation of where Satan's throne is. We know that there was a lot of pagan spirituality going on. It, it's very possible that he's referring to one of the pagan temples of the day. And we also know that there was a synagogue with Satan in the other city. So, But th there's a lot of satanic influence in this city. There is a throne of Satan, which is probably, spiritually speaking, just an evil pagan temple of some type. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. This church held fast to his name. They didn't deny the faith. That means that they had been through trials and tribulations. They were holding fast to the name of Jesus Christ. They had been tempted to deny the faith, but they would not deny the faith. They would not deny his name, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. They had a faithful martyr in that church, Antipas. We don't know much else about him, that he died for the name of Jesus Christ. He was faithful unto death. And when one of your fellow Christians gets killed in your city for being a Christian, he is a faithful martyr, you also consider, well, I could be next. So in your head, these other Christians, hey, my friend, my brother in the Lord just died, so maybe I'm next. You don't really know. But in their hearts, they had to be in that place. I, okay, I'm, I'm willing to die for you, Jesus. And they say they, they were faithful. And it was where Satan dwells. Maybe it was at a pagan temple. Verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. He has a few things against them. He, he is the faithful judge. He sees everything. He has eyes like a flame of fire. And not this whole idea. Today, some people take the book of Revelation real light when Jesus speaks to churches, and they'll take a very casual approach to it. Well, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect church, except you see, you know, a couple of them here where they didn't have sins, and, you know, we all have some issues, and, and they make like it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Jesus makes a huge deal out of it. He's going to fight against them with the sword of his mouth if they don't repent. That, that's a huge deal according to the word. You can't interpret it any other way. But some people will gloss over this and say, well, you know, you might have this sin or you might have the sexual immoral and, well, you know, something that was always there. And I, I'm not making light of this because this isn't light stuff that Jesus said. It, it's, it's hard hitting. And we need to take the seriousness and the weight of what Jesus is genuinely saying here. Yes, they had faith. Yes, they did not deny his name. Even the days which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among them, where Satan dwells. He says, but I have a few things against you. Th this but's important. Just as important as are good things are the bad things. Because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality those pay attention to the word that because you have those who hold the doctrine of balaam those i don't believe the entire church was holding the doctrine of balaam there there were those in that church that needed to be addressed there were those in that city that claimed to be christians that this pastor and the rest of the church needs to address and they're being addressed too that you have those there that hold the doctrine of balaam yes you have some very faithful people but you have those there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And we know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump. This needs to be dealt with. This whole thing could spread around. And this doctrine of Balaam is described here. It says, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So what happened? We went through this. We went through the book of Numbers that Balak is a king. The Jews are in the wilderness and the Jews are getting towards the promised land. This king Balak wants to hire Balaam to curse the Israelites. He's a prophet of God, Balaam, but God will not allow him to curse the Israelites. Even though he's enticed with money, he wants to do it, but God won't allow him. He's a, Balaam's a wicked man, but he is a prophet. 
So what Balaam does is he gives Balak advice. He gives him counsel to basically get the Jews to commit sexual morality and to get involved into idolatry. Because see, Satan has come after this church, obviously. Jesus is saying, I know where Satan dwells. I know where his throne is. I know the Antipas was killed where his throne is. There is a spiritual battle going on, and this church was not caving. They were not caving into the persecution. So what did Satan do? Well, if Satan can't get these guys to personally quit, what he can do is he can get people to do things that will cause God's judgment to come against them. He's got them in a position where he can't make them personally quit, but he can bring them into a place where Jesus is going to come destroy them with the sword that proceeds out of his mouth. He's going to come fight against them and destroy them. When Jesus fights with you with the sword, against, with the sword that comes out of his mouth, you get ruined. You, you don't make it. And that's what often happens today. Satan sees what you're doing, and maybe he can't get you to deny his name. Maybe persecution rises up. So what does he do? Well, maybe if I can get you to sin, then you'll bring God's judgment against yourself. Something that he can't do to you, but he can make you bring God's judgment against yourself. And that's what we did to this church. You have the doctrine of Balaam. Commit sexual morality, get involved in idolatry. God's judgment is going to come against you. He's going to come fight against you with the sword of his mouth. So Jesus is addressing this now. Now, Numbers 31, 15, and Moses said to them, you have kept all the women alive. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident at Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. The counsel, Balaam's counsel was get these people to sin and God will judge them. I don't need to curse them. God will judge them. And for this church, Satan can't get them to quit. So what's he going to do? Bring in some false teachers, hold on to this doctrine. God will judge them now. You don't need to do anything. Please turn with me to Numbers chapter 25 in verse 1. In this account here that the Lord is referencing, and a lot of people try to make this clear break between Old Testament and New Testament. It's, it's Old Covenant, New Covenant. We don't have a priesthood, a Levitical priesthood. We have the the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek, which is Jesus Christ now. We have the sacrifice of Jesus. So it's an old new covenant, but things that happen in the Old Testament still happen in the New Testament. The same type of false doctrines are still there. So they do mesh together. Numbers 25, verse 1. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove. And this, this is after Balak had wanted Balaam to curse these people. He couldn't get Balaam to curse them. So this is when Balaam had given him the advice to get them to sin. This is Balaam's doctrine. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the woman of Moab. So here's their sexual immorality. And they invited the people to sacrifice to their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Again, Balaam could not curse them. God wouldn't allow it to happen. So what Balaam counseled Balak to do was get these people involved in sexual morality, get them involved in idolatry, and God's going to get angry with them. God's going to come against them. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened with the church of Pergamos. That's the doctrine of Balaam crept in. Do these things. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal at Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses. It could have been sexual morality right in front of them. In the sight of the Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman threw her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who had died in the plague were 24,000. 24,000 people died because of that sin. If God judged them, and God is telling this church of Pergamos, you have this doctrine, I'm going to come fight against you with the sword of my mouth, he's going to judge them too. God is not partial. I cannot emphasize that enough. There is no partiality with God. If he judges sin back in the day, he judges it today. And what are the sins? Look at it here. 
This is the doctrine. Eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual morality. Eating things sacrificed to idols. Back then you had idol temples which cooked food. And the food itself wouldn't defile you, but it's the actual going there, participating in the ceremony, bowing down to their gods, doing that ceremonial thing. And that's what they did back in the book of Numbers. And so what's happening here is that there's this ecumenical movement where you can practice idolatry, practice Christianity, and it's all good and God's okay with it. No, God's not okay with it. He wasn't okay with it back then. He's not okay with it today. Idolatry. One of the biggest idolatry things that Christians just blatantly flaunt is a Christmas tree. And I know that many of them do it in ignorance. Mo the most of them do it in ignorance. They've been lied to by pastors. Pastors themselves are lied to by traditions and by people at cemeteries. I mean, se I say that on purpose. I'm referring to seminaries, but they're often death places, so I call them cemeteries. They've been lied to. And so the lie continues, the tradition continues, but it's an idol. It's a fact. From the Bible, it's an idol. I haven't made that up. I'm not twisting it. It's an idol. People put up their idols, and they worship God, and I got my idol. God is not okay with that. That is a doctrine of Balaam that you can have an idol. Even in the New Testament, keep yourselves from idols, it tells us in 1 John. Keep yourselves from idols. And idolatry can be other things too. And again, it's very ecumenical. Let's just all join hands and worship God together. Sexual immorality. That was involved in this. I call one of the local seeker-sensitive churches the Church of Sexual Immorality because a lot of people I meet there, or meet that go there, not going there, but because of my work, I meet people that go there. A lot of them, a lot. The majority I've met are sexually immoral people, but it's okay. It's okay. They don't judge that sin. It's, they have the doctrine of Balaam alive and well there. So I do not say, oh, it's good for you that you go. No, it's not good that you go there. So what does Jesus say? He also goes on to say, Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And we went over that last week, to, to conquer the people. It was also believed in early church history that it was just a doctrine of immoral living. Jesus hates that. And, and then the doctrine and the works of the Nicolaitans, they go hand in hand. What, what you believe is what you live. What doctrine you go after, it's how you live it out. And you have those, I don't, again, I don't believe it's everybody, that you have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans. So this pastor and whoever else is in leadership needs to address this issue to deal with those. And then Jesus says, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You must do a 180 degree turn. Your heart must turn back to Jesus. You must confess your sin of the doctrine of Balaam of the doctrine of idolatry, of the doctrine of sexual immorality, that you're okay with it, that you practice it. You must repent of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, or else I will come to you quickly. Jesus has been patient, but now he's going to move quickly. It, it wasn't that they, they just sinned one day and Jesus is coming to destroy them. You got to understand the patience of the Lord, because those that try to mock, those that come against once saved, always saved, they try to mock me sometimes, Oh, so I sinned yesterday, so I'm not saved. That's never the impression you get through the Bible. There was patience here. They actually brought in their doctrine. They were living out their doctrine. And now Jesus is saying, I'm coming quickly. Now it's time to move. It's not just a, I had a bad day. I'm unsaved, but I'm saved today. And they mock it like that. They don't know the Lord. When you know the Lord, you realize I rest in him. And when it gets real bad, he'll send somebody to me and warn me. If I, if I harden my heart to him, he will send somebody warn me. He, he, he won't bring destruction unless there's, the prophet comes and warns first. I forget where that's from. I'm calling off the top of my head, but he always warns first. He'll warn you. He will warn you before he destroys you. He had Noah, a preacher of righteousness, before the flood. People are warned because it's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He will warn you, and he will warn you again, but eventually he says, I'm coming quickly now. I've warned you. You know this is wrong. Now I'm coming quickly. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And he says them. I, I point out there were those, there was them in this church. There, were, there was these false doctrines creeping in. Not everybody held to him. He's going to fight against them with the sword of his mouth. That's his word. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. To his eyes are like a flame of fire. There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to his eyes. We must give an account to him, to Jesus. You have these, 
people today that, oh, well, you need to be accountable to another man. There's nothing bad having a brother or sister in the Lord that you confide in, that you pray in. But the vast majority of the time that I've seen people use that as an excuse, they're no longer accountable to God, but they're accountable to other a whole bunch of other pastors that are practicing the doctrine of Balaam. Well, they said, I'm okay. They told me not to judge so much. <laughs> you can all be accountable to each other, but on the day of judgment, you know who we have to give an account to? Jesus. He has the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. A board of lukewarm elders is not going to be up there. You're not going to have an ecumenical group of so-called Christians that met in our city that said, oh, we're Christians and this is what we do. They're not going to be up there judging you. You're not going to give an account to them on the day. You're going to account to Jesus, to what his word says. Everything you do is open. Hey, he has eyes like a flame of fire. He sees everything. And he's going to come fight against them with a sword out of his mouth. They don't win. They lose unless they repent. You, you can't win a fight with Jesus. When Jesus says, I'm going to fight with you with my sword, you can't win. It's just you, you need to surrender. You need to repent and confess your sin. And if God did this to this church and wrote this to them, he says it to us. It's not one saved, always saved. It's not, you can live in sexual morality, but because you just happen to say that magical prayer, you're okay. I know the Church of Pergamos didn't know that doctrine, but we know this doctrine, and you said the prayer, so you're good. It's, it, it, it's false doctrine. It's a lie. It makes Jesus evil because it makes him partial. In Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. He does not change. Romans 12, 1, for there is no partiality with God. James 2, 9, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. People that try to play the one saved, always saved game and say, well, you can be sexual immoral, you can practice idolatry, you can be a drug addict, you can do whatever, but you're saved, are making Jesus a sinner. They make him partial. He would say it to Pergamos, but he can't say it to you. He would judge them that way, but he'll never judge you that way. Whoa. That's really not right. That's, I, I don't like to say that's not fair, but it's truly not fair. It's not fair that Jesus would say something like that to Pergamos, but not to somebody else because they know a special doctrine. They've been enlightened. He says it to everybody. It's all the same. There, there's no partiality. I would not want to give Jesus an attribute that's sin, that the Bible says you're evil. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. They make Jesus a sinner. I'm not going to make Jesus a sinner. He's not partial. He says this to Pergamos. He says this to me. He says this to Pergamos. He says that to everybody that says they're Christian out there. It applies to everybody, not just to this church, to everybody. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So he ends this letter, or excuse me, ends this section with this church. You have to have an ear to let him hear what the Spirit says. And to him who overcomes, he'll give some of the hidden manna. You got to overcome. The hidden manna, again, we don't know exactly what that is, but it could be literal manna in heaven that's hidden up there for those that have overcome sin, those that get the crown, those that cross the finish line. We know that it is angel's food in Psalm 78, 24. It says it had rained down manna on them to eat, given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. It's angels' food. So maybe it's, a, it's an angelic food that's in the heavenlies that Jesus has some set aside for us. And you'll go there, and you'll partake of that manna if you overcome. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. The white stone, we, we don't know exactly, but I want to focus on that name. You're going to get a name on that stone which no one knows except him who receives it, if you overcome. This is the promise. Now, those that are hard-hearted, those that, that say, well, I'm not going to tell this person to repent to them, this is very troubling. But to us, it's, it's great. We're like, yeah, I have every intention of repenting when I'm caught in sin. I, I want to repent. I want to turn. I want to do what's right, Lord. You see my heart. And we look at this and we say, great, great, because we'll get that new name on that stone. You're going to get a new name on a white stone, and this name is very special. No one knows except him who receives it. Only you and the Lord will know what this name is. When you get to heaven, there's going to be a special name that you have from Jesus because you're his bride. Jesus knows you individually. Yes, yes the church is a larger conglomerate of people, of every tribe, tongue, and nation, 
But on a personal level, the Lord will give you a new name. It's going to be written on a stone. You have such a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord that way. And I want to know that you're special to him. There's that special walk that you have with him. And I can't emphasize enough on this side of eternity that we each learn to seek him out that way, that we each learn to seek that, yes, we come together in fellowship, and we fellowship with one another because we have fellowship with God, but that on our own personal time, that we have this own walk with God that, that is so personal, that is so unique, that nobody else really knows how you know him. They know him personally, but you also know that I went out with the Lord today. I walked along and I prayed to him. I got in the Bible. He spoke to me by his spirit. He knows me, and he's going to give you a name that perfectly represents who you are to him. What a beautiful day that is. And so as Christians, when we read this, even if they were in sin, they should say, well, I, I want to repent and get the stone. I want to repent and get some of the hidden manna. It's that easy. He doesn't say that maybe you can earn your way back, or maybe if you, you do all these things, you'll have enough time to do enough good works to earn your way to heaven, because that's not what the Bible teaches. All you have to do is repent and turn back to him. Make him your first love. Live for him. Do it all. For, it's all him. All, repent. It just means 180. You do a 180. Just turn. That's how easy this is. Yes, it's a, the narrow, difficult road, but just to get right with the Lord, it's just a 180, a change of heart. Just repent, and you're going to get this white stone with a name written on it, which no one knows except him who receives it. You'll know it, and the Lord will know it. It'll be your own special name. In the days that we're living in, I just exhort you to get your eyes fixed on that stone, to get your eyes fixed on Jesus, that you're going to get a new name, that soon this will be all over. We look towards Jesus, be rich towards him. We want to be like the church of Smyrna that Jesus says, you're rich, you're rich. We want to be faithful unto death and you'll get the crown of life. We want to be looking towards that crown. We want to be looking towards that stone. The things here, we're going to leave them behind. Even if you live a full natural life to say, it's so short. It's, it's over so quick. You could be royalty here on earth, but that ends. We want to be royalty in heaven with our crowns in heaven. We want to have that special name in heaven. So may our eyes be fixed on Jesus in these last days. Yes, times are changing. Yes, I, I get grieved when I see how things are going in our country where we've been allotted certain freedoms and liberties, and, and you see it going away. And there are many people who are just following it and going for it. And yes, you have some that resist it, but at the end of the day, we know which way it's going according to the book of Revelation. It's going to go. It's going to be gone. I, I hope it doesn't go super fast, but it's going, and it's going faster than I thought it would. It's the... The pace is becoming more and more rapid. But as that happens, look towards Jesus. Now's the time to buy gold from him, not to buy gold on this earth and see, figure out how, how you can save your life on earth. No, now is the time to say, Jesus, I, I need to get some gold from you. I need to be rich towards you. I just want to be in your will. I, I want to be faithful unto death. I want to overcome all these trials. You're my first love, Lord. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, Father. I thank you for everything that it says. I thank you that you're not partial, Lord, that if you promised a new name to the church of Pergamos, you promised a new name to us on this white stone. Lord, if you promise a crown of life to a church, you promise it to all your people, Lord. So I pray for that crown. I pray for that name on that white stone, which only we will, <laughs> we will know as a person and you will know, Lord. And I thank you for all these blessings and promises. Lord, I pray that we'd partake of some of the hidden manna. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.